We're only going to come up here, or Emily and I agreed as anyway, if we had somebody of a rather younger generation that would come and join us, because we thought, well, it might be a good idea if we had a little bit of a spokesperson, Sophie, from a younger generation, who might be interested in food. Well, this is the, the last session for the day before we move into reflections. And just firstly, thanks very much for joining us, Sophia. It's it's really cool to have you up here. And I... It's my pleasure. <laughs> um, and so what we thought we'd do here is just have a couple of minutes for introductions. I won't introduce on behalf. I'll, I'll let everyone here introduce themselves. Then I'll pose a couple of questions um, that have come out throughout the day. And in the remainder of the time, we'll have an open collaborative discussion um, with the participants in the room in a co-creation session. So I'll start at this end and we'll work our way down for the introductions. Kia ora, um, my name is Kay Baxter and my life journey has been about um, health, basically. Um, when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, I'd had cancer twice, all my teeth out, most of my thyroid out, full caesareans, ulcers across both my scar tissue, across both my eyes, and I've spent my whole life researching what makes health, what creates healthy people, and I've... I'm really excited about the journey that I've, um, I mean, along the journey, along the way has been like introduction to the, perm well, we did the first permaculture design course in New Zealand about 29 years ago or something, 84, and, um, you know, saving seeds and heritage fruit trees, been a lot of amazing um, things that have been part of my journey, but I think... Um, the most exciting part has been the last 10 years in my life where I've been coming to realise and understand that, um, which, uh, um, I mean, permaculture, which there's going to be much more talk about that, is like a design methodology. So it gives you a way to make sensible decisions, common sense decisions, which work with the laws of nature. And so what I've come to understand is that when, you, when we reconnect, we step back into that process of co-evolution, we look at the ancient patterns, we look at the principles of science, we look at the principles of ecology, and we look to see what works, and we start getting the universal, um, the energy of the universe starts to support us and work with us, and you can create something a lot more powerful that creates health for all. So my, so my journey now and my life now is about um, sharing what it means to me to step back, in, back into that process of co-evolution, which is about working with the laws of nature. It's a really, really exciting journey and process. Uh, kia ora. Um, my name's Emily Williams. Uh, I grew up on a farm in Canterbury, very traditional sheep farm. Of course it's not now, it's all cows. Um, so the whole landscape has changed considerably. Um, we used to swim in a river close by us. The river is now totally dry. Totally dry. It's really heartbreaking. Um, my uh, journey into permaculture started when we decided, when we had a young family, that, that we wanted to bring them up in the country and we wanted to bring them up on an organic farm. We had a couple of uh, mentors when we were living in, this, in a city area next door to us who really encouraged us along that path. So we moved to the country and we've started developing um, an organic farming system also based with permaculture and biodynamic principles in it. So it's been quite an integrated farm development um, and no doubt a little bit more we might hear about that as we go. Um, it's a great journey, we continue to learn um, and we'll never stop learning as we go. So. Anyway, I'll pass it on. Okay. Oh, I'm old enough to sit down, aren't I? <laughs> I went along with that journey. It was the same one. Um, I probably had a slightly different view of it as we do. Um, my comment in terms of where, who I am and where I'm at is that I actually feel somewhat in a different world to what I'm seeing around here or what I'm hearing around here, actually. Um, and I just do sort of wonder what sort of world I'm in or what, where the world's going. And, and because I suppose, I mean, I come off a farm as well and, and my parents went right through the chemical system, really, and out the, other, out the other end. By the end of it, when they retired, they thought this was the most ridiculous thing that's ever happened. 
to farming, and that's what my belief was, that industrial agriculture, I don't even want to hear about it. There's no solution there at all. I don't care how you adapt it. I don't care whether it's to do with plants, animals, insects, fish, or whatever. It's a failed system. It's only there because of a flush of cheap energy, and it's not going to continue. So let's get on to the real solutions, which have nothing to do with industrialising growing of food and, and um, giving ourselves good nutrition. So um, we sort of came into permaculture by sort of osmosis, really, um, and, and then later on got a little bit more formal education about it. <laughs> um, but my sort of, um, sort of my background is, is that what so appeals to me about permaculture is, and this is why I see something that's quite difficult, I think it's hard to marry up ag, ag tech to me, is because it's very observational. It's very uh, grounded in the place you're in. It's very specific to that place. There are no rules. There's no toolbox you can have a drop-down menu on, I'm afraid. <laughs> you have to be out there with it, connected to it, absorbing it, responding. It's very adaptive. It's being, being, being responsible. If you are sensitive to what's around you, you will respond, <coughs> and response means responsibility. You take responsibility. You use your ability to respond. Um, so I, I struggle a little bit in terms of where I am in in this situation with you. So you can ask me some questions about that if you like. But um, as Emily really said, our main aim of, of changing from the city um, was to have a good environment um, for our children and a healthy one for uh, us and our children. And it was about that, that environment. And the only way to have health as people it's a living, healthy environment. And the only way to have an environment is a very diverse environment made up of all sorts of creatures that support themselves and therefore will support you. So I don't know if that says much about me, but that's what I can. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob Corker, um, Kay's husband. Uh, we've been on a similar long journey together. Uh, I grew up in a, a rural community in Northland, and um, we had a, valley, had a valley there, in some ways similar to this, but otherwise quite different. But there was five, um, fam um, five families in that valley, and they all had small farms, and I was part of that community. And over my lifetime, I've seen that valley go to a point where there's no farms in that valley now left at all. And uh, when I came across um, permaculture, I was totally wrapped in it, and I have been ever since. It's, for me, it's just an amazing way of looking at the world. And as part of that journey, some of my energy went into, I was a co-founder of the Kuanga Institute, and we put a lot of energy into supporting our, what I see as our um, biological, cultural um, biodiversity. And I've put a lot of energy into um, thinking about and experiencing and creating ways that we can integrate people back into the environment again. Because what I saw is that, is that if we, if we want to take a permaculture approach, so the integrated um, system approach to the landscape and the environment, then we need to get more people into that environment because the, the permaculture systems are by nature more knowledge intensive, more experiential based, more um, people intensive, more management intensive. So to, to create those systems you need people and you need organisations of people. So that's been a major focus for me is, is um, we, we essentially have all the technology in terms of biological agriculture, that, that's not an issue. Our biggest issue is our social um, systems that we need to change. So. That's, that's where I'm working and we're in the process of um, creating um, the village up where we are, that's a Kotari village, and part of that is risen out of our desire. We've got 90 hectares up there and it's, it's um, being put in a trust and the trust basically says, let's create a model as to how we can have integrated land use and a healthy environment and a good place to live and productive and entrepreneurial um, community. So that's what the trust is about, and and um, <coughs> my job is to one of my jobs is to make it happen. So and later on, I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about um, what permaculture is. So in two minutes, apparently. Yeah, two minutes. <laughs> Thank 
Kia ora. My name is Sophia Royster and um, I've been doing very well in school and um, I've been having fun learning things and i um, happy to be up here and Thank you very much for joining us. So okay. I've just got a couple of questions and then we're going to open it up to the floor. But um, I guess for the last two decades now of, of my life as a sustainability scientist, I've designated probably five to ten years learning about the biosphere, so all the layers of the biosphere, how the soils, water, air interact, then pivoting and learning everything there is about business and entrepreneurship and government policy and spending five to ten years learning all there is to know about that. The purpose for me deep diving into this is so that I can find the leverage points within the system where one small change in one thing creates a big change in everything. In order to do that, you need to understand all of the layers and the data sets. So what draws me towards permaculture, and I guess the essence of my question is, it seems to me, given the principles and the methodologies of permaculture, that we have the opportunity to be acupuncturists and have to have multiple beneficial outcomes that we seek in the world, both for people and the planet. Um, I guess there's three broad um, principles of uh, permaculture, which is care for people, care for the planet, and return um, all the goodness back into the system. So just to give a, a bit of a framing from, from the wisdom that's on this panel, I'm wondering, um, Bob, quite a macro view, if you wanted to give us a bit of an outline of your understandings of some of the principles and the methodologies about how, uh, how permaculture has these multiple beneficial outcomes. Have we got that whiteboard yeah, pen? it's just down here. Okay. Do you want to hold that up for me and I'll... Um, okay. Oh, maybe I'll stand down here. Okay, so th this is a, um, a classical sort of permaculture <laughs> teaching tool. So in any system, there's sort of energy in. So it's the source. And then there's the sink, there's energy out. And in any natural systems, there's a whole lot of elements within the system. And they're connected in various ways. And basically, they're all sitting around there saying, I want a slice of that energy. So in, in any, any um, natural ecology, um, it's really efficient use of the energy. And the, and the energy source for us in the past has been the sun. So for hundreds of thousands of years, maybe millions, of, well, for billions of years. Oh, sorry. Okay, so for, for billions of years, the, the, the ecology of this planet has been driven off the sun. That's essentially the only source of energy. And all these different things, all these different critters and, and components of the system have evolved to use that energy in the most efficient way and to share it amongst themselves in the most efficient way. So that's a, a quick picture of um, how biological, ecological systems have evolved. So what's come along is all of a sudden we've found another source of energy. We've found another two sources of energy in a way. The first one we found was forests. So we found we could cut forests down and use those as a source of energy and put it into our system. And we were doing that on an unsustainable basis. So over thousands of years, we've slowly crept our forest away. And then that took quite a while. But then all of a sudden, we found fossil fuels. And we could do things a hell of a lot faster. And, and this went into that system. And then what happened is... Um, <coughs> we started to find that instead of having all these little dots here, maybe we could just have one big dot and another big dot there, and we could get just as much out of it. We didn't have to worry about all these lots of little dots and things that were there. So, um, but the problem with this is it essentially went against the, 
the principles of ecological behaviour that we've evolved with over millions of years. We were trying to do something that's going to cause us grief. And this system of fossil fuels is only about 200 years old, really. And now we're coming to grief. What permaculture said, and Bill Mollison came up with the idea of permaculture, he, he, he looked at the original model, because he spent a lot of time in the wild as a naturalist, and he said, well, if nature can do that, maybe we can do it too. So that's essentially what permaculture is about. It's saying, let's design systems that have a lot of diversity, they have a lot of interrelationship and they use the energy in the most efficient way. So as a permaculture designer, my job is to go into any system and it doesn't matter whether the system is this building here or this farm or the whole valley or the whole of New Zealand. It doesn't really matter. It's a, it's a system. We put a boundary around it and we call it a system. So my job as a permaculture designer is to say, what elements am I going to put into that design that are going to um, <coughs> maximise the use of that energy and to look after the whole system and provide a yield for everyone. So that's permaculture in a nutshell. Everyone clear on that now? <laughs> so um, are we going to apply the same thing if we're looking at heritage seeds or a Biden, um biointensive garden or a farm or whatever. So a large part of my journey now is about, okay, <coughs> how do we design um, integrated communities in the landscape? And, and um, we've lost most of those models. And, and just the same as um, our friends from Taupo were colonised, my ancestors were colonised. I was chased off our... Uh, my ancestors were chof, chased off our land in Scotland. And the reason why they were chased off is because the industrialists from the south were able to make more money out of using Cheviot sheep and they had less shepherds and they didn't want all the crofters getting in the way, so they chased them off. So it's the same story. The, the, the story that we've been sold over the last two or three hundred years is that industrial development benefits everyone. And, and some of that story was bought into and, and, and because there were definite advantages. But now what we're finding is industrial um, development has become a nightmare. We're actually dismantling the planet. So we have to come up with something different. And for me, permaculture is one of the few things which has really stood out and said, this is the way we do it. Now, we've got, we, now what we've got to learn is all the different strategies. We know that we have an understanding of how we do the design. Now what we've got to come to understand is what are the strategies we use in any particular place? And they're going to vary. It's not always going to be the same. So that's part of our journey. And for me, it's one of the most exciting things um, and we've got this challenge in front of us. So we come from a totally different space than some of you here, which is really interesting. But I'm really looking forward to, to bringing our experience and our expertise to join with yours because and the bottom line is we're all in this together. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Okay. Woo! Okay, I'd just like to... to to see to a couple more questions and before we open it to the floor. One that's been on my mind all day in various guises is this thing of yield. Um, it's been raised and all throughout the, the discussions today and um, I guess I quite like Scott's perspective as, as far as, you know, if we are kind of undertaking a projection and scenarios of business as usual, then we do know that we need to produce more food in the next 40 years than we have in the last 8,000 years. WWF have just released this research. It's backed by a whole ton of scientists and um, data projections. So given, given that scenario, I'm wondering, Kay, whether you've got some views on, on yield with permaculture. Um, uh, my understanding is that um, I don't know, well, 
there's a man called John Jevons in America who's probably the most anal systems analyst I know. I mean, he's anal about collecting information and data, and he spent 40 years doing it, and my understanding is that the biointensive system of, of gardening, which is based on all the ancient agricultural systems which grew soil and civilizations, is many times more productive than any other system on the globe. Um, and you can get up to 10 times more production for a ten, you know, way less water, way less energy, way less everything. It's like there's no system more efficient that I've ever seen or heard of. And I've been practicing that for 20 years or so, and um, I'm totally convinced that, it's, that there's no other system that comes anywhere near it. Just riffing off that is, is water. Um, and it's also well known that agriculture, current agricultural practices are taking up 70% of the world's water resources, freshwater resources. Um, so, uh, Gary, I'm just wondering, um, you've got a reputation for your love <laughs> of both two things, and I've heard it from multiple people, <laughs> <laughs> that you talk to Gary about water and spirals. So, can you just, yeah. Well, they're the same thing. <laughs> Water moves in spirals, interconnected spirals. Um, and I was very pleased, where is she, that did the um, thing about water? Um, great. I mean, so often we talk about food and we forget about water. It's water that makes all food do its thing, not be digestible, makes all organic chemistry work, makes the whole world work. It's water. And we sometimes think, oh, well, I'm growing good food, that's fine. We've got to have good water, good vital water, good um, properly energised water. Um, and, 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 and sort of stepping back from sort of my point of view about water, and I'm only allowed two minutes to talk about this, which is ridiculous. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> and then a few seconds have gone there. <laughs> um, is it basically, I mean, water is the basis of all life. It's movement, you know. Life is about exchange. It's about exchange, it's been something that's different. And water facilitates exchange. So everything that moves is to do with water, and if it doesn't, nothing moves, there's no existence. You just, nothing, so. Um, so really, life is about water combining with carbon, which is a strange thing, and they have all these combinations and add all sorts of things on and make big, long um, molecules. Um, and that's what life is, basically. So we, we really need to know what's going on with the water. So one of the first things we need about the water is inside us, the water that we take in and what's the nature of that. And water's a very strange thing. It's got all these strange anomalies. And that's why it can do all the things it can do. It's not like a lot of other similar uh, chemical molecules. Um, and so it's, that, it's the nature of water in many different ways. Water is just not H2O. You know, if someone tells you that water's H2O, we'll just say, what type of H2O or something? You know? <laughs> because it's very different and it combines in all sorts of ways and does all sorts of marvellous things. Um, and so we need to think about not just as water, and not just whether it's polluted, but what is the actual nature of the water? What is the water doing in this environment? Because that's a, it's a, the health of that environment we very much do with the health of the water. Um, and that goes for the oceans as well, which is a very interconnected water body, obviously, and, and life is very interconnected because it's all immersed in water. Uh, and it's also a, an environment we tend to forget, and, and, and surely in New Zealand we should not. That's our um, main source of food and both plant and, and, and animal or fish food actually. It's hugely productive for seas around New Zealand. Um, and, and actually our land is relatively not that productive in terms of its uh, mineral base and, and um, de depth of topsoils. Um, so I just sort of want to make a plug that you really think a lot about the nature of water, its energetic levels, its way it, you know, I could probably say it here. The way it memorises what's happened. It's a very interesting thing about water memory is just something that it recalls what happened to it, therefore it changes what it does. That's what you do for memory, you know. If you recall that something happened in the past, you change what you do. If you use memory in that technical sense, then water's full of memory. And, and it remembers where it's been and what it's done. So um, the nature of water is a really important foundation to me to life. And so 
just make that plea again. So thank you for the person who did that poem about the use of water and, and, uh, and how we need to look after water and how we need to relate to it, because as we relate to it, it relates to us and it's the foundation of everything for me. So one final question before we open things up. Um, so given that our bodies reflect the environment and the environment reflect our bodies and that they are interconnected, I know that you have some unique views on this, Emily, um, around the, the nature of that connection and that's something that we haven't discussed and it is at the heart of permaculture and that's love. Um, and I'm wondering if you can share a few words on, on your views on that. Sure, I love food. Um, <laughs> but what I love is good food and a lot of our food is, doesn't fall into that category. Um, and I love growing food in a good, healthy way. So that means really communicating with your soil and, and appreciating what really good soil is. So it's, it's, um, I've, I've fallen in love with bacteria, basically, after they've had so much bad press for years. It's just fantastic to see that they're getting a bit of good press now. Um, we're still told to wipe them off the bench. And dare I say it, but I was just told, well, women have been told to wipe their nipples before they breastfeed. I mean, how ridiculous can it get? <laughs> <laughs> um, I heard somebody say that over the... <laughs> it's just crazy. Um, but getting back to food. <laughs> um, the, my garden's really important to me. It's a, it's a meditation space. It's my best teacher, and I continue to learn from it all the time. Um, and growing food with, with, with love and with feeling is, is really important so that you're continually doing this communication thing um, with the soil, with the earth. And then harvesting it in the same way, harvesting it with care and with, with um, consideration, thinking about what you're taking out and then what you're putting back in and replenishing what you've taken out so that you can continue this cycle of producing good food. And then it comes on to cooking that food and cooking with love and thinking about the people you're cooking for and what you're doing with it. And it's actually getting more complex, of course, to cook for people now because you have such a wide variety of diets. We never used to have this, you know, vegan free, uh, vegan and, and wheat free and dairy free and solanaceae free, and you know, it's getting a lot more complex, of course. Um, and I don't think we've got time to go into the reasons why necessarily for all of that. But I think it's so important our food but it has to be done with love and we've got to get away from all this processed stuff and get back to what really food is and grow it in such a loving and caring way. So do you want to add to that, Kay? Oh, yeah, I would, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so one, one of the um, really amazing things for me in the last seven years or so has been, I mean, I've spent a lifetime learning about what makes healthy soil and how to grow healthy plants, but I've only recently come to understand how our food communicates with our bodies and it makes a really big difference to a lot of things. When, so that's come through the science of epigenetics. There's a new science, the new biology, called epigenetics. And essentially what that science shows us is that, you know, the double helix spiral that we see in our mind's eye when we talk about DNA, well, a very small part of that is what, is we call, is what we call a DNA, and the rest of it, our scientists called the junk DNA because they didn't understand its function in our body. Mm -hmm. And we now know that that is the part of our body that communicates with our food. That's quite important, and with actually not just our food, our water, and the whole environment that we provide yeah. for our body. And so the quality of that communication between the environment, which is largely food and water, but also thoughts, you know, just the environment we live in, everything, the quality of that communication determines the strength or the weakness of the tags that the junk DNA places on our DNA, which determines how our health, ex how our bodies express in this lifetime, and how the health of our children and our grandchildren, and so on down. And my understanding is that there are only three things that we know at, the, at this point that the junk DNA communicates with in our food. One is minerals, one is vitamins, and one is traditional fatty acids. 
fats and oils, traditional fats and oils. So it's the levels and the quality of fats and, oil, of fats and oils and vitamins and minerals in our food which determine our health and the, and the maintenance of our DNA. And the, the, I really quickly, I just want to mention, and so the only research I've ever seen in the world ever which shows what we need to maintain our health through generation after generation after generation is the work done by Western Price. There's a lot of ideas about what will make healthy people, but I don't see that any of them stand the test of time. And I think as, as an older person in today's world, one of the things that I've learned is it's really important to look back, and that's the permaculture, permaculture design. You go from ethics, principles and patterns, to strategies and techniques. And one of my big lessons, having been a vegetarian for a long time, was that there are patterns of what make healthy people. And it doesn't, it's not about being a vegetarian or not a vegetarian or whatever. It's about getting the right levels of minerals and vitamins and um, fat and oils. And so part of the whole health thing and permaculture, it all comes together and everything when you get it right, support it all supports the whole. But there are some really important um, patterns coming out of science and coming out of the, the understandings of indigenous peoples which I think are really important for us to look back to. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just before we take it to the floor, Sophia, did you have anything to add? I'd like to know, like, um, how the salad is produced in the um, vegetable gardens and um, and how it works and stuff. That's a great first question. So, um, does someone from the panel want to answer that? It was around how does the salads go from the garden to your plate, right? Very quickly. what we put in our mixture of salads or what when I go out to the garden I will harvest lettuce a multitude of weeds a multitude of other greens and put them all together and make a salad are you talking about sure. I think she's asking something else how does it grow? yeah how, how does it, it grow? grow I'll tell you how I think it grows <laughs> well, my understanding is is that when we plant a seed it's really important that we choose a heritage seed mm. because we need seeds that can communicate with the life in the soil. And it's really important that we have highly mineralised soil, the right minerals and the right relationships, and that we have lots of microbes in the soil. And the life in the soil, the microbes, communicate with the plants and the plant roots. And the healthier the soil is, the healthier that plant will be. And if we if we have a really highly functioning, healthy plant, it can, that's what we need to maintain our health. So mm -hmm. our whole journey is about remineralizing the soil and creating highly microbially active soil so that we can create really vibrant, high bricks <laughs> plants so we can have health. <laughs> can, I, can I add something to that too, Sophie? And did you, you may not realise it, actually, that inside you, what you're actually feeding is the microbes inside you, yeah. down in your guts and in here. And they're very similar to the ones out in the soil there. So when that salad's grown in the, out in the, on the land and taken up all this information and energy and other things that's going into your body, it goes into your body and very similar microbes down there. That's why you ate dirt when you're young, you know? You went around ate a bit of dirt and put it in you. Good idea, that. You know? Got those microbes down in your tummy, yeah? You remember doing that? Oh, I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did that. <laughs> That's what you're feeding. Just remember that. You're looking after your own microbes. That's what you're doing. Great. Thank you all for, for contributing here. I actually have two questions. Um, the first is the sort of modifications that you're experiencing to the permaculture approach due to the effects of climate change. Permaculture is obviously very grounded in the um, in being observational and on historical patterns, but unfortunately we're facing times when historical patterns are no longer 
the best predictor. So I'd, I'd just love to hear, you know, as, as we sort of try to apply permaculture techniques, um, maybe how do we think that the, the next 50 years might look a little different than the last 50? Um, the, two, the two strategies that I'd be working with around climate change is um, seeds. If we choose heritage seeds, we have, they have inbuilt into them the ability to adapt to climate change as long as they're grown in micro, highly mineralised, microbially active soils. So the second strategy would be it's about carbon in the soil. It's about building humus and life and carbon in the soil, which gives the whole system more resilience and flexibility and ability to adapt and change. Can I just make one comment too? I mean, if you just do the right thing and having a really healthy ecosystem, and that's how you're getting your food from, then it'll be resilient. I mean, nature does know how to adapt to these things if we give it a chance. You know, it's often enough we just got to get out of the road and let it adapt. And the problem is we're in the road. So, so it's not that nature doesn't know what to do, it's just that we're just getting in her road a bit. And so I, I, I don't see climate change is not a problem for the world or guy or we want to, and it might be a problem for us in terms of how we're going to adapt. So all what we've got to remember is to be adaptive ourselves. And that's what permaculture is about. It, it, there's, no, there's no ideology in permaculture, right? There's nothing fixed, because it all depends, it depends on situation. So whatever situation you're in, you know, you can still apply the principles and the ethics, because that's the foundation. And, but the main thing is that you are continuing to adapt. You know, and that's what nature does, so, so should we. I'll just add my bit. So, um, I mean, basically we're in a situation where we've either um, removed carbon from the soil and we've removed the plants that normally take up the carbon. So most of the carbon's gone up into the air. So if we agree most of the problems we're facing are because of carbon, we've just got to focus on putting carbon back in and sequestering it. And there's lots of ways we can do that. Great. Uh, the second question, um, just to take up time, um, or take my time, excuse me, uh, is just, you know, the, you sort of mentioned the, the sort of um, different of perspectives, uh, difference of perspectives. You know, we're coming at this from very much a, a young a student, you know, mind. And, um, and I'm curious just, you know, if you were speaking to, you know, 10,000 engineers in Silicon Valley right now, who are saying, we want to build tools to enable the broader spread of organic biointensive farming. What tools would you invite them to build based on your experience of knowing the challenges that you run into? Well, what I would tell them to do is take a year off and have an internship on a farm or in a forest or something or other. Thank you. <laughs> He echoed me entirely. I was going to say, come woofing with us for a while, if you like. <laughs> uh, my take on that is, is we actually need to start creating models for how we could do things differently. We've got most of the conceptual theory. We've got a, a lot of the tools and everything we need, but we actually need to start putting together on a social level some different models and seeing how they um, perform. And then at that stage, we can either scale them up in terms of size or scale them up in terms of numbers. Oh, that was a, that was a really big, strong hand going up over here. And you've got a T-shirt that says, yeah, 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 nah, yeah. So Kiwi. Um, I was just wondering, uh, I always thought permaculture was you needed a big farm, but you said today that you can do it anywhere. So I've got like 2,000 square metres. Um, how do I start? Check out our website where we've got a 200 square metre urban garden model happening to show how you can feed a family of four mm. all the nutrition that you need on 200 square metres. And we just got a crowd funder filled 100% the other two days ago, a week ago, to take it to another level. It's amazing what you can do in really tiny spaces. And, and actually, if I can just add to that, one step at a time, one square metre at a time, just take your lawn, liberate your lawn, put a few plants in it you can eat, you know, and don't try to convert the whole lawn at once and just make a mess of it, you know? Yeah. Learn small. In the web address? Sorry? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, www .org nz. Nick. 
Um, thanks very much. I found your um, contributions really um, refreshing. And it seems to me that sort of like the some sort of question in my mind has been really the collision between the art and science and the trade-off between it, you know. So to me, the responses and your comments have been really about saying, you know, life is an art and how I use the land and how I grow my food is actually an art and I developed that art over a period of time and you can't just immediately lock that into a science, scientific model to scale it. And, you know, I think it's a story that I've received a lot from various farmers around New Zealand. And I think it's an important point for us to realise that actually perhaps we're talking about something that isn't purely about science. Um, epigenetics is fantastic. I've been studying that in Amsterdam. Basically, the DNA that we're, we inherit when we're born is only 10% of who we become. 90% of it's contextual, the inputs, the food and everything. So are we actually scientifically based ourselves? I, I, I'll have to answer that. It's a nice philosophical question. <laughs> Between the whole science and the rationality and irrational. We are irrational creatures. And I say that sincerely and it's a very good thing we're irrational. Um, um, because the world actually lives on ir irrationality or non-rationality, shall I perhaps we'll say it. You know? So science can be helpful, you know? evidence can be helpful. Um, but like most things, it's, it's the add-on. I mean, one of the things that frustrates me about our education system, to take it slightly differently, is we pump people full of theory from the age of 5 to the age of 25, and when you put these poor creatures out into the real world and they think they can do something, you know, all, all real teaching <laughs> is done by experience, first, theory, later. Put a framework around it. Do a little bit more, put another framework around it, you know. So there's nothing wrong with science, it's a bit of a framework for our observations, but, you know, we, we have been farming for quite a while with, without too many high-tech, you know, science and stuff. Right? And, and the issue to me is that when we have used technology and high science, we've made a bloody mess of it, so put it mildly, you know. So, but I wouldn't say for that reason, therefore, science is not useful. Right? I think it's a evidential basis is very useful. Trying to make sense of your observations is very useful. You know, planning is a very useful thing to do, particularly in a in a temperate climate with seasons and you know how you feed, feed yourself in winter and all that sort of thing. So. Well, first, I really wanted to honour all of you. You know, our, our farmers and people who take care of the land are some of our greatest heroes and heroines. And you know, you should be on the celebrities on the cover of magazines. But in that world, we won't have celebrities. So. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you all. And I was talking with Kay at lunch briefly about seeds and um, the dilemma of seeds because part of what's happened is basically we've commodified life, you know, that is at the core of this, and objectified it. And we used to have something called a commons. And if anything reflects that, it's our seed stocks. This is the, our, our collective heritage and something that belongs to everyone and to no one at the same time. And I think that this is something that is not addressed by our, our economics at large that's you know, representative of the kind of discussion that you're having here and the kind of work that you do. And there's even a layer that I'm hearing of what you're doing beneath that, which is really what's called ecological services or ecological functions, which is what runs the show on planet Earth. You know, oxygenation, pollination, riparian zones, clean water. Um, farming is actually at a, at a different level. It's a byproduct of all of that. If you're taking care of your ecological functions, you're going to have extremely healthy and productive food systems at large. We had a fellow at Bioneers a couple of years ago, uh, John Liu, who took the largest 35,000 hectares on the Lust Plateau in China that was utterly degraded. I mean, it was ba looked like the moon, basically, after centuries and centuries of bad land management. And in 15 years, by restoring the water flow, basically the hydrology, they created a Garden of Eden that is also an incredibly productive local economy and food system. Um, so I think that you guys are really working with those underlying ecological functions. And I just wanted to name one other quick thing, which is that so much of this does come back to the economics in, in many ways. And one of the Dreaming New Mexico things that we found, because how, how do you sustain small and medium-sized farms over time, particularly in a commodity-based economy, which is very um, erratic at, at best? And one thing is long-term purchasing contracts. So we discovered that the state of New Mexico um, actually spends 10% of the total food purchasing in the state 
So we negotiated with them to make long-term commitments to buy local food. I mean, very straightforward kind of a deal. Um, there's a, a cooperative in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, in the States, also called the Evergreen Cooperative, which has set up a model of anchor institutions. Um, they have been bu building local businesses that are often minority-owned or for disadvantaged communities or work cooperatives and so forth. So they have long-term stability. They went, it's what's called EDS and MEDS. They went to the schools and they went to the hospitals, the healthcare system, who are anchored in the community, who are not going to cut and run as a corporation often will, you know, and they built long-term contracts. They now have the largest greenhouse growing operation, I think, in the country um, th that is for, you know, at-risk youth and for, I mean, for all the right people, basically. So I think we need to look at the economic side of that, too, of how do you rebuild community in the economy so that's built to last, you know. So anyway. <laughs> Yeah, can I, I would really like to make a comment on that because I think, uh, let's go for going over time a little bit more, but, but I think that's really critical. I mean, I, I've done a lot of work on the land and, uh, you know, I came off a farm and, and, I, and I went to the city and I learned a few things there and that, you know. But, 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 but one of the things that, that's really sort of got to me over, first of all, was the economy and the fact that it was totally corrupted and exploitative and, and privileged and all that sort of thing, which, you know, you know about so, like take some things out of a commodity, make land no longer a commodity, put it back in the commons or in trusts or, or whatever, take it out of private ownership, you know. Um, but the other thing that really I've, I've also come to, sort of, to realise is that in the end, like as Bob was saying, we've got all these things, we know these things, we even know how, how a good economy could work, you know, that would, would, would actually support the people and the environment and be just. It's the decision making, the collective decision making to get there what I think is really missing is the question of governance, the question of how we make decisions collectively to move from one thing to another, you know, because we can't move until we can make collaborative decisions as a, as a, as a collective, not as, as individuals. And I think that's what I'd like to see, a lot more sort of thought and, and even visioning on about it. And, I mean, I'm trying to do my little bit and I've got some propaganda, with, I, if, if anyone wants any. I'm, I'm a pamphleteer, I'm, I'm not a bloggist, I don't go on the internet, but I do it as a real book on paper, you know? Um, and so I think that's a real issue, this whole question of governance as well. Um, and if we have that collective vision, we can all work in our different parts of the world in order to build that vision um, in those pathways. So we've got one more question and Christiana's been very patient. So say I build a robot, and um, I mean, because artificial intelligence is really, I, I, I was challenged recently in a, in a tech workshop where they were saying, you know, the artificial intelligence is going to be able to write the most beautiful songs, like it's going to be able to create art and beauty and all of these things, not just to perform automated tasks. So imagine like a few years down the line, um, I build a robot, and that robot is, is fully trained with all the permaculture principles, but it also has observational capacities to notice the different dynamics um, as they're, you know, the light, energy, sunshine, you know, soil, moisture. And then that <laughs> robot can build a permaculture garden, like everybody in every apartment everywhere with their little deck of, you know, 50 feet can have a permaculture garden that their robot maintains for them and then delivers like the fresh produce and harvests it into their fridge. And it's a good thing for biodiversity and it's a good thing for carbon sequestration because every rooftop and every patio and everybody has a permaculture garden. <laughs> Is that a bad thing? Would be the end yes. of life on Earth. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Stepping back into the process of coevolution, which we've always been in for the last 200 years. We want, we want people doing it, not robots. But, 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 but the, the question, what I've said back to you is think of the energy required to run that robot and how is it. You know what Bob said at the beginning about the whole energy flow? You think, you think of a robotic artificial intelligence one doing it, mate? You know? Um, and I mean, I mean that's, that's the issue, isn't it? I mean, do, isn't, isn't a better robot a nice person you could talk to? You know? <laughs> oh, yeah, I, that's what I was going to say. It's like, do you love gardening? Why let the bloody robot do it? <laughs> and just on that as well, I've just read some research that uh, this, this thing of feeding the world with permaculture, and some of the most recent research has come out that has said, you know, only 1% of the population is currently involved in, in farming. Um, and if we moved that to 
of humans who are um, actively working the land through permacultural methods that we would have enough food to feed the world even on business as usual scenarios. So can, can I just make a comment too in terms of where most of our food is grown? And, uh, and um, I'm sure you, you, you would know a person called Vandana Shiva who's a very activist in, in positive solutions in India based around small farms. She was here in New Zealand, just had a conference just last weekend. Um, we heard her too in Otaki, dear old Otaki, she came there. And she made this point that 75% of the population gets fed from farmers who are on small farms. 75% of the population of the world gets fed by farmers on small farms, little farms. Highly productive, diverse things, most of them. I mean, that's where I think the future is. I mean, I think we've just gone down a, a wrong alley for too long. You know? and, 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 and whether technology can help us get back into unto, unto the small farms, you know, they're talking about supporting the small farmers. They're the most productive ones. You know? As Bob said, it might take a little bit more people, as we want, don't we? Want to be involved, want to be connected, you know, know where the food comes from. So, cool. Um, I'd just like to thank you so much. Um, <laughs> yeah, it feels good. I've got a question okay, about what do you believe is the future of the collect the seed collection that. And <laughs> I knew, I thought that might happen, and I was kind of dreading it and kind of hoping it would happen. Um, so we've got this collection of New Zealand heirloom seeds, which is about 800 different seed lines, and we've saved that collection because a group of people, mostly our age, who are now in our mid-60s, have worked for nothing for 30 years, basically. And we can't do it anymore because there are other things we need to do in our lives. So I'm actually, I only really, and this wasn't in my mind when I left home to come here, but it feels like I need to say that um, I actually asked Kenny at lunchtime, so what happened in America? Because I know that he was really involved with all that stuff in America. And he basically just said straight back to me, it's the commons, and everybody has to pay for it. The government has to pay, or someone has to put... We actually can't do it anymore. We actually can't do it. So unless there's a group of people who want to save the seeds for the whole, they won't be saved. Yes. I say yes. yes. I'm stepping yeah. up. <laughs> I'm so sure there's other people who will. The people who are asking, asking from the technology world, they're asking for something that's digestible. You, see, like you guys have amazing wisdom that they really want. They don't understand it. They grew up in a different world. We need to translate it to their world so they can actually help. Yeah, we, we'll learn. need you to help us do that because yeah. we don't have the same, uh, I don't have the same, um, I don't know their world. Yeah. Yeah, I really feel, feel for Kay on this and I was recently talking to somebody else that said that there's a, um, a herb place in New Zealand called Fragrant Herbs and they're this, in the same situation. They've been saving seeds and saving plants for many years, but they're getting to the stage where they can't do it any longer. Who's going to step up and take it over? And it's a big problem all over the place. Seeds to us. I know. <laughs> we already can't do it. It's yeah. like it's a job for the nation, and who cares? Like, who cares enough? It's, we've been asking that question for a long time. Mm. But it's in the real world out there in the soil. You've got to do it. Mm. Thank you very much for the work all of you do. Um.